So I guess I will I will read a little bit of an introduction. I'm Nancy uh, from the Chelmsford Library, everyone, and thank you all for coming. Uh, tonight we have librarian Jeff Klapes back for another of his popular armchair travel presentations. This time we'll be visiting Southern Italy's biggest city. Naples is brash, chaotic, and lively, but has a long and layered history, which can be seen in its many gorgeous churches, piazzas, and museums. Naples is also the gateway to the beautiful Amalfi Coast and offshore islands like Capri and Ischia. Uh, and of course, uh, it's world famous for its delicious cuisine. Jeff is recently retired uh, from the head of reference position at the Lucius Beebe Memorial Library in Wakefield, Massachusetts. He's an avid traveler and photographer. So uh, thank you very much, Jeff, welcome. And I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much. And welcome back, everybody. Thanks for having me again. Um, I see someone just mentioned that they love my background. I wish I could say this is my house, but it's not. It's just uh, it's a famous villa in the south of France that I wish was mine. Um, but anyway, uh, for those of you who have been before, you know the drill, uh, which is that um, with a group this size, um, Feel free to ask questions throughout the program, um, but please put them either in the chat or the Q&A, and um, I'll try and keep an eye on that as we go through. Um, and if I miss any, um, I'll stay at the end as long as necessary to uh, make sure we get any questions that you might have. So I'm going to get started and share my screen, which is, uh, whoops, hold on one sec. Okay, that should be okay. Um, and we will get started. Um, uh, I hope I hope you know that this was uh, that this program is about Naples, Italy and not Naples, Florida, um, which I have not been to. Um, so um, if you're disappointed, I'm sorry, but I think you're gonna love Naples, Italy anyway. This is a trip I took just actually a couple of months ago. Um, I was trying to escape the uh, December weather here in Massachusetts and Although Italy in December is not exactly beach weather, it still was perfectly pleasant. And uh, it was a nice getaway for me. Um, so just again, to try and put it on the map, Italy, uh, I'm sorry, Naples is the third largest city uh, in Italy. It has over 3 million people. Um, it comes after Rome and Milan. And it's an extremely old city. Um, it was actually first settled by the Greeks around 800 BC, and um, the, um, I'm just, whoops, I'm just checking a, oh, never mind, I was just checking something in the chat. Um, so it was settled by the Greeks around 800 BC, and in fact, that's where the name comes from. Naples, or Napoli in Italian, is from Neapolis, meaning new city um, in Greek. And to kind of put it on the map for you, here's just an overview of the Bay of Naples, which is, oh, a couple hours or so um, south of Rome. You can take, uh, there's a fast train or it's an easy flight. Um, and the Bay of Naples is very famous for, um, well, millennia actually, although particularly in the past um, couple of centuries when various romantic figures writers and artists uh, throughout Italy uh, made Naples and the Bay of Naples part of their uh, grand tour of Europe. So there's a lot of that kind of cultural influence there. What I want to mention about tonight's program is we are really going to focus just on the city. Um, and that's partly because of uh, the way I wanted to do the program and partly because um, when I went there, the weather was kind of chilly and it rained a bit. So I didn't actually end up going to Vesuvius and Pompeii and other places that people often go. I will definitely go back at another point um, to do those kinds of things later. Um, and I spent all of my time in the city and was amazed to discover what a really intense city it is and just how much there is to see. I think it's kind of a shame that many people go through Naples and spend only a day or so because they're on their way to head down. You can see my pointer here. Uh, they visit um, the, the volcano of Vesuvius. They go to the ruins at Pompeii. They head down to the island, uh, the Isle of Capri, and they work their way along the gorgeous Amalfi Coast. 
Um, and it makes sense to do that, obviously, because those are all very beautiful areas. But I think people often um, give short shrift to the city itself. Um, I was there for eight days and barely had enough time to see all the things that I wanted to see. So I think it certainly merits its own um, investigation. Um, it's a major foodie destination, as you can imagine. All of Italy is a foodie destination. Um, here's a typical Italian breakfast. Um, and uh, as I'm sure you know, Naples is also very uh, famous for its Neapolitan pizza, uh, which is very different from the pizza that um, you can get here in the US. Um, I had a wonderful room. Uh, I stayed in a guest house. Um, it was a, a separate room in a private house that a woman owned in the middle of the old city. And this is the view from the roof terrace. You could see 360 degrees. Um, it was kind of rainy the night that I got there, but the view was still spectacular. And in the morning, this is what um, I could see. Mount Vesuvius, which is the huge mountain, um, kind of double peaked mountain off in the distance, uh, is clearly visible. Um, it's only about nine miles away. And you can also, um, heading around to the right, you can see the peninsula that has um, Sorrento and um, on the backside is the Amalfi Coast. Um, that's that's the part that's going off in this direction. Um, the part of the city that I stayed in was the old town. Um, and it's certainly has the most character of any part of the city and it's very walkable. Um, in fact, it's almost hard to do anything but walk because the streets are so narrow. You'll see that as we go through. Um, and this is kind of an overview of it from up above. Um, Naples does have some skyscrapers and some modern development on the outskirts, but most of the old cities really retains um, a very uh, ancient feel to it, a very Italian feel with very um, narrow streets, uh, cobbled streets, and uh, very few buildings that are more than a few stories high, and most of them are old. Um, I also want to point out that most of the cobbled streets that you see are in fact made of dark volcanic rock. And that's um, perhaps obvious because you're sitting right under a, um, a volcano that has been active at various points in its history, most famously when it um, buried Pompeii and Herculaneum. Um, but there's volcanic rock everywhere and they use it in buildings, they use it in streets uh, to pave the streets. You will often find it particularly in some of the older buildings which are made of a mixture of, um, you can see there's two colors of stone here. The lighter colored stone is a more uh, softer and more workable stone called tough. Um, and the darker stone is actually uh, a more durable kind of lava. And they're both used um, in buildings throughout the city. And it makes for a very interesting architectural style because there's so many black and white buildings. Uh, here's another good example of that. Um, the neighborhood I stayed in was wonderful. I was right around the corner from a very lively piazza called the Piazza San Domenico Maggiore, which has lots of cafes and lots of shops. Um, but I'm going to take you through some of the major sites um, that if you were there for, say, a few days, these are the, the major institutions that you would probably want to see. There are castles, there are museums. There are neighborhoods to stroll through, so I hope you get a, a, a good sense of just how, um, how amazing the city it is. Um, this is the Royal Palace. It's actually one of four throughout the area that was built by the House of Bourbon, um, which um, Italy, of course, uh, without going into too much of the history, uh, many different um, powers uh, held sway over uh, the Italian peninsula at various points in history, all the way back to the Greeks, um, the Etruscans, the um, uh, the Bourbon dynasties, the Angevin dynasties from France, the English were there, the Spanish were there, the, and it goes on and on. Um, and the Bourbons ruled uh, the area around Naples in mostly in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and the palace, of course, is very um, monumental and very classical in style. Um, inside, you can see the monumental staircase that goes up um, to the apartments on the, on the next floor. The um, facade of the building has a whole series of 
uh, life-size sculptures of various famous um, uh, politicians and military figures and so forth. This gentleman who is kind of surprisingly well endowed for a public statue um, is Joaquin Murat, who was a military commander. Um, we may run into him once or twice later. Um, he, he actually ended up marrying Napoleon's younger sister, so he was uh, pretty well known at the time. Um, but the inside of the palace is is spectacular. This is the, the main staircase. Um, I was there again in December, so uh, right in about two or three weeks before Christmas, and Naples does Christmas really big time. Um, and many of the monuments and the streets were full of Christmas decorations. Um, so you can also tour the apartments. It's very sumptuously de uh, decorated, sumptuously decorated. Um, it has suffered, um, as have other buildings in the city, through earthquakes, fires, various other things, um, and including some bombings in World War II, but it's been beautifully restored. So you will have a chance to explore, uh, oh, scores and scores of room, all of the state apartments on the upper floors. Um, and the decor is really pretty over the top. Um, this is the throne room. And uh, the incredibly detailed decoration, the furnishings um, are really something to see. And also, um, if you're interested in this kind of thing or are doing research, part of the palace is now used as the National Library. Um, so a whole wing of it is devoted to that. The ceilings in particular are, are just stunning. And you'll even find some odd things. I loved this uh, as a librarian. Um, I enjoyed this particular contraption. This is a, a fascinating early reading desk. It rotates. Um, so uh, it spins around and you can have various books on the different platforms. Um, and it kind of reminded me a little bit of today having multiple tabs open in your internet browser um, and you can bounce back and forth from one to the other. But it was quite a, a fascinating contraption from back in the 18th century. Um, the palace uh, that we were just in fronts on this uh, huge piazza, which is called the Piazza del Plebiscito, which is named for the vote in 1860 that made Naples a part of modern uh, unified Italy that happened at, at that time. For many years, it was a parking lot. Uh, and in the 1990s, uh, it was completely renovated. The parking was put underground. And now it's a, a beautiful open um, public space. The, the building that you can see opposite, which looks a little bit like the Pantheon in Rome, if you've ever been there, is a church, um, Catholic church. Virtually every church that you see um, in tonight's program is uh, Roman Catholic, which probably doesn't come as a surprise. But um, unlike the Pantheon in Rome, this, this church has this uh, elaborate colonnade that goes in both directions. Um, and both the church and the colonnade uh, were built by the well-endowed statue guy that I just pointed out uh, a few minutes ago on the building opposite. Um, inside, um, it again, it would if you've been to the Pantheon in Rome, you can see the uh, the obvious resemblance. Um, it's actually dedicated to Saint Francis of Paolo. It's the dedication to it. Um, there's a lot of really um, sort of pompous, grandiose architecture in downtown Naples, particularly around the area where the palace is. This is the luxurious Grand Hotel Londres. Um, and there's a number of similar buildings in the area that have a very distinctly Italian look. Um, also in this neighborhood is the Castel Nuovo, which is the known as the New Castle, um, even though it dates back to the 13th century. And that's, of course, because there were even older castles. Uh, this one is well worth visiting, um, because partly because of the history associated with it, and also just the architecture is, is uh, quite fascinating because it has been influenced by so many different time periods and rulers that made their mark on the building. Um, in fact, you can see here between the two big um, defensive towers, there's a very elaborate um, decorated archway, which is from 1470, that was built much later and kind of wedged in between. 
Um, the design of the castle was influenced by the Aragonese from Spain, by the Angevin dynasty from France, and various others who were making their mark um, as they um, were uh, in charge of the, the southern Italian peninsula. And you can tour most of the building either on your own or with a guide. It's very imposing both from uh, the inside and out. Um, when you first enter the building, um, you'll see this elaborate fresco um, under the archway. And that's, um, it doesn't actually depict anything in Italy. Um, it is, in fact, um, a painting of the Plaza Mayor, which is in Madrid. It's probably the most famous public space um, in the Spanish capital. And that's because at the time, it was the Spanish, the Aragonese, who were um, who were building um, and doing work on the castle. Um, so they made sure that they were represented. On the right is the entrance to the Palatine Chapel, which has a Renaissance door. And probably the most uh, interesting interior space um, is what they call the Hall of Barons, uh, which is now used for um, city council meetings. The, the, the actual uh, modern municipal government for Naples meets in this room. Um, it's called the Hall of Barons because way back in the 15th century, um, the king of Naples at the time um, invited a bunch of barons uh, to dine with him here. He had discovered that there was a conspiracy against him. Um, so on a social pretext, he um, brought them in for a fancy meal in this room. And then through uh, the tiny little um, openings that you see way up high, he had them all killed. Um, and uh, so that's where it gets its name now. The, the, the highlight of it, though, is the, the vaulted ceiling, which is in this beautiful star shape. It's particularly impressive. And the view from the castle um, is also quite nice. You can go up to the top and walk around the parapets, um, and you can see all over the city, um, as well as all the way down the Bay of Naples across the port. It's right again, it's right next to the water. So there's an excellent view of the harbor. And of course, Mount Vesuvius off in the distance. Um, here you can see the, the port, which um, has a lot of um, cargo shipping um, and also a huge amount of passenger travel because there are cruise ships um, doing the Mediterranean that will stop here. Um, and also an extensive system of ferries um, that go from Naples to various other parts of the Mediterranean and also um, nearby islands. If you're traveling around the, the islands in the Bay of Naples or other places along the Amalfi Coast, um, this is where all those ferries would depart from. And looking in the other direction, back towards um, uh, the city itself, we're going to go in a little bit up to the top of this hill, the highest hill in the city, um, where there is another castle, fortress, um, and a beautiful monastery. And you can also see the dome here, the glass dome of the Galleria, which we'll also visit shortly. Um, back in the old city, if you go a little back um, towards where I was staying, um, another major sight to see is the Duomo, the cathedral of the city, which is technically the Cathedral of the Assumption of Mary. Um, and it is a Gothic cathedral, as you can see from the facade here, um, from the late 13th century. Um, I thought this was kind of fun here. They actually have open confessionals. And this young boy was just going up and doing his religious duty. Um, the church is very beautiful, the Gothic um, nave, but probably the most dramatic part of the church is actually a later addition that's stuck on the side. Um, it's a separate chapel called the Royal Chapel of um, San Genero, um, who is the patron saint of Naples. And this was built much, much later, a good like 400 years later after the main church. And as you can see, it's um, really like over, over the top, elaborately decorated um, with gold and um, frescoes and marble and so forth. Um, just uh, a completely over-the-top experience and very different from the rest of the church. San Genero is also um, in the basement. Um, if you go down below, um, there's the crypt where he is buried. And as the patron saint of the city, obviously it's a, 
a place of important pilgrimage and um, religious importance. There's also a museum associated with the church, which you can visit. This is the treasury um, of San Genero, which has uh, royal jewels from different time periods um, when there were kings of Naples and so forth. So there's an immense collection of um, silver and um, this unbelievable bishop's hat. Um, that's the one on the right here which was made in the early 1700s and is encrusted with, um, and I'm not making this up, 3,700 emeralds, diamonds, and rubies. Um, the value is, is simply immeasurable. Um, so it's well worth um, the, the extra visit to, you have to, you have to pay a separate admission to go see the treasury, um, but it is well worth it. Um, another thing to do, um, is called the Capella San Severo. There's um, a lot of churches. Um, in fact, Naples has, I forget the exact number, but um, it has, I think it is known as um, the city, the, the city that worldwide has more churches than any other city. Um, and I would certainly believe it because you can hardly walk 50 feet down the street without coming across some church, big or small. Um, this huge line of people waiting here um, and it goes way further than that, like um, I think the line was probably three hours long, is for this tiny chapel um, called the Capella San Sevo, which unfortunately they do not allow um, photography in. So these are two photographs I took um, uh, from elsewhere. It was created um, by a duke um, in the late 1500s. And so that was a time period when the Baroque was in style um, and in fact, uh, the Rococo style, which is kind of like Baroque, but even more so, <laughs> very over the top. Um, uh, the building was started at that time period, and a lot of the decoration was done over um, the next hundred years or so. Um, so as you can see, there's these unbelievably um, uh, detailed and very alive sculptures that come right out from the wall. But the highlight of it, um, is this particular sculpture. This is called the Veil Veiled Christ, um, and it's from 1753 by an artist you've, a sculptor you've never heard of called Giuseppe San Martino, um, but it is one of the most famous sculptures, uh, certainly in the city, um, and in fact in all of Italy, and um, to see it, um, you can actually get up quite close to it. Um, it is just um, mind-bogglingly um, realistic when you see the the detail of the um, the drapery of the shroud hanging over the the underlying body and it's just it's hard to believe that it's made of stone um, a bit more accessible if you don't want to wait in line are a number of other really nice um, religious institutions around the old city this is the cloister of uh, san gregorio armeno the um, saint gregory the armenian and this was a Benedictine monastery built in the 16th to 18th centuries. And the church is very nice, but um, even more so the gardens, the cloister um, is quite beautiful with orange trees and the, the beautiful arches. Here is the, um, the refectory where the monks would have dined and the elaborate um, gold covered Baroque style uh, church. Um, it's kind of fun to be, I've, I've found this in many cities in Italy, and Naples is, is no exception. You can be walking down a very narrow street and see a church, and you think, oh, I'll stick my head inside and just see what it looks like, and you'll be hit with this, um, where in any other city it would be considered one of the most um, impressive monuments in the city, but um, often in Italian cities, they're a dime a dozen. <laughs> it's, it's kind of incredible. Um, another fun one that's just a little different, very tiny. Um, but if you like things that are a bit off, uh, offbeat and uh, macabre, you can visit the Church of Santa Lucia ai Libre, which is tucked down a very tiny little alley, and they have an underground crypt. Um, and it's uh, famous for something I'll show you in just a sec. Um, they they hang offerings on the walls, and there's a number of um, monks who were buried 
um, not always in one piece um, in the crypt. The most famous thing there um, is this skull here, which looks like it has little ears on it. Um, and so that's kind of the, the famous thing about the church is that you can go and see the weird eared skull. Um, it's not actually ears. They're little bits of mummified cartilage um, that just happened to survive on the skull. Um, and for many, uh, many years, people prayed to it thinking that uh, because it had these little ear appendages, um, it was uh, a sign that it would allow you to communicate more easily between the worlds of the living and the dead. Um, whether it worked or not, I'll leave that up to you, but it makes for a, a very interesting place to visit. And um, they also have all these um, little votives that you um, hang on the wall made out of little uh, pressed metal. And you can see, um, you may be familiar with these from other, other European cultures as well. Um, they can be an image of a hand or a, another body part like um, in this case, there's a stomach and some intestines. Um, the idea was the, the image represents whatever it is that you're praying to God um, or the saints um, to help you out with, whether it's a physical ailment or love or a relationship or wealth or so on and so forth. So it's, um, it's, it's an interesting kind of place. Um, and as I promised, I am going to show you a number of food pictures because um, Naples is all about food. Um, here's a good example of a uh, margarita pizza, which is probably the most, the simplest and most famous of, um, uh, of Naples pizza. It's thin crust, um, which makes it a little bit different from pizza that you can get in different places in the U.S. Um, and it's cooked at very high temperatures, but for a shorter time. So um, it tends not to have as many different kinds of weird toppings that you get on American style pizza. Um, there are different kinds, but um, nowhere near the breadth um, that you'll find here. Um, they also tend to be a little bit smaller. You're more likely to get uh, a, a pizza like this, which is an individual pizza, a meal for one person. Um, and because of the way they're cooked, they're often, they're crisp on the outside, but they can be a little bit soggy in the middle. Um, so most people tend to eat them with a knife and fork rather than slicing them in pizza slices and, and eating them the way we do. Um, here's uh, another of the millions of churches in the city. This one just happened to be right next to my guest house. Um, and another one around the corner. Um, I believe, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, there are over 500 churches in the city of Naples, and I would certainly believe it from walking around the street. Another important one to visit um, is the cloisters of Santa Chiara, which is also in the old town, um, and this is an even earlier abbey than some of the other ones I've shown you. It goes back to the 12th century. Um, although the cloister was completely redone in the 17th century, so it has um, these very beautiful frescoes and a new ceiling. What makes it um, worthy of visiting in particular is uh, this highlight in the gardens in, in the middle of the cloister, um, because the entire place is covered with Maiolica tiles um, from the mid 18th century, and they tend to be um, in these bright uh, Mediterranean colors, so bright blue and gold and green. Um, there are columns um, completely covered with tiles and benches and walls all the way around the entire cloister. And particularly if the sun is shining on them, it's a, it's a beautiful space. And there are fig trees and citrus trees. Um, so it's, it's a delightful um, escape from the, the bustle and the narrow streets of, of the old town. Um, here's a close-up a little bit, um, so you can see a little bit better what the tiles look like. Um, because they're ceramic, they tend to last a little bit better than some other kinds of materials would. So um, despite being three, almost 300 years, three, what is it, 300 years old um, at this point, they're still in excellent condition. And here's another view of all the columns.
Here's some more food. Um, caprese salad, um, which I make here a lot um, out of things in my own garden, if I can, uh, in the summer. Very simple ingredients, fresh tomatoes, um, fresh mozzarella cheese, basil, olive oil, um, and that's pretty much it. And if the ingredients are, are fresh, um, it's absolutely delicious. Um, something a little bit different. This is an eggplant casserole that I found in a wonderful restaurant, uh, very rich uh, with red wine and olive oil. And then they sprinkle pesto sauce and little um, croutons over the top. That was delicious. And of course, breakfast. Um, Italian breakfasts tend to be very simple. Um, in fact, many people eat them in a local cafe, as I did across the street um, from where I was staying. Um, it could be just a pastry, uh, coffee, here's a cappuccino. Um, often, if you're a real Italian, it's probably accompanied by a cigarette. Um, and you probably are just going to eat it on the go, um, standing or, or sitting at a... Um, uh, counter in uh, one of the many, many cafes um, along the streets. And probably if you live there, um, you get used to going to very uh, local cafes where you know the um, the clientele and you know the owners and it's your regular spot on the way to work in the morning. Um, there's also a lot of food like this um, coming and going, deliveries of vegetables and meats and um, other things to supply the many restaurants and cafes in the area. Um, another big church in this area that's worth visiting is San Lorenzo Maggiore, which is um, particularly interesting. Uh, it's a nice, the church is nice, um, but I think uh, even more interesting is what's underneath it. Um, the um, uh, there's a particular room that's worth visiting. This is the chapter house, um, which is where monks would have gone um, daily to uh, uh, read literally chapters from the Bible, um, from scripture. Um, most mo monasteries would have had a chapter house, um, and usually there are benches uh, around the side that the monks would sit in, and chapter houses very often are... Um, either square or round, this was a, a good example, um, and have elaborately painted ceilings. Um, this is now a Franciscan monastery. Um, and um, so you can see some of that in the iconography um, and the, the paintings of historic monks that are associated with the monastery. Here is the very Baroque um, ceiling of the refectory where they would have eaten. Um, but a really interesting thing about this church is that underneath it um, is an old Roman market. And again, remember, this is a city that goes back to 2,500 years or more. So there are actually Greek ruins. There are Roman ruins from later periods. Um, and under, under this church complex um, is a complete Roman market area that has been excavated. And you can now go underground. Um, so even though we are beneath a uh, a church from the oh Renaissance and and Baroque period afterward, um, underneath it in what is essentially the basement um, is a complete Roman market street with um, all of these. Each of these archways represents a store that would have sold sold some kind of goods and paved streets, um, archways. Um, it's it's just a fascinating place that um, you would never even know it was there. It's um, um, but you can tour it separately um, if you visit the church. And speaking of the underground, as old as Naples is, um, it has one of the more modern metro systems in Europe. Um, and in fact, there are you can take tours. I I just went on my own, but there are actually organized tours that will take you through different um, uh, metro stops because uh, the architecture and the design of many of the stops, particularly on one, one particular line, uh, the main line one that, that runs through a lot of the, the center of the city, 
Um, the the stations have all been refurbished in the last uh, two three decades with very elegant designs and sometimes very edgy um, public art. Um, and each of them has a separate theme. So it's kind of fun. Um, for me, it was a good a good opportunity to uh, explore something different, but also because it was raining, <laughs> I could spend a couple of hours exploring underground without having to get wet. This is the main station um, at the Garibaldi Central train station, which is the, the main train station for the city. Um, and uh, of course, like in many old cities in Europe, um, as soon as you start digging underground, you find all kinds of archaeological stuff um, that may need to be incorporated or rescued or um, put on display. Um, but if you go down this line, particularly line one and line six, have some of the nicest uh, designs. And they're, um, the, the stations themselves are not really that much different from what you would find in terms of their physical space. They're not all that different from uh, stations in Boston. It's the decoration that makes them different. And um, they're, each one has an incredible design. Uh, that one was at the cathedral. This is the university stop. Um, Naples University is a couple stops down. The most famous of, of all of them is um, Toledo, which is a Spanish name, um, but um, it's the name of one of the main streets, um, the main shopping street in that part of the city. And so this entire um, underground station is designed to feel like you're underwater. So it has blue and, um, blue and white tiles of different colors, and it even has a light show. Um, this um, this dome over the main escalators has uh, a light show that is almost like um, like the Aurora Borealis. It changes different colors of green and blue as you're going up the escalator. It's it's absolutely incredible. Um, and uh, when you get to the top, it completely changes from this watery underground design um, to a much more uh, rocky geometric design um, that goes with the neighborhood above ground. Uh, there's also um, another station that's um, dedicated to Dante, um, the poet. So this, this elaborate neon um, is quotes from uh, the Inferno in Italian. Uh, this is also in that same station. And then finally, when you get up to the um, archaeological museum, which is um, another one of the main sites to visit. Um, there is a replica in the metro station of some of the more famous works in the museum. This is the Farnese Hercules. So this isn't the original. You can see the original in the museum, but they have designed the station to make it clear that you're getting off at the at the archaeological museum. But Naples has a lot of old stuff too. Here's a, a, a pharmacy from the 19th century, very old fashioned, um, but still a fully functioning modern pharmacy that sells stuff just like you get at CVS here in, uh, uh, here in Massachusetts. Um, not far from there is another church I wanted to visit just because it was a little different. Um, Santa Maria della Sanità is a 16th century church, um, and there are catacombs underneath. If, if you like catacombs, um, Naples has uh, several different ones that you can visit. Um, and this one, um, underneath what, what you're seeing here, this stairway that has these kind of appalling marble cherubs on it, um, the stairway is quite unusual. Um, and the reason it was built this way is because they knew when they were building the church, um, even though it's a it's obviously a very old church, but the catacombs are even older. And so they deliberately built uh, the altar um, up high, uh, which allows access to um, the earlier basilica over which the church was built and that access to the catacombs underneath. So it's just kind of an unusual interior design to have these um, fancy curved stairways that go up to the altar rather than having it be on more or less the same level. Um, here's another church just in a neighborhood, uh, beautiful 
Baroque facade with modern art right next to it. Um, one of the other major museums to see is um, the Capo de Monte, which means top of the mountain, which it quite literally is. It's on top of one of the big hills um, in Naples. Uh, and it's another of the several royal palaces that were built um, for various royals uh, throughout its history. And it was originally built as a hunting lodge and a summer palace. Um, and it's been turned into one of the country's major art galleries. Um, unfortunately, I hiked all the way up in the rain and discovered that it was closed on the day I went there. So, oh well, those kinds of things happen. But it's a beautiful park. Um, and the view over the city is quite nice. Um, there's a very uh, nice and quite large formal park that has pathways and gardens and fountains and sculptures and so forth. They even have a Latin fountain for dogs um, to have something to drink. And of course, if you're sick of the rain, um, you can stop almost anywhere to get Italian pastries or lunch. Um, this is actually a, a meal of, um, uh, on the left are some pork sausages, homemade pork sausages and broccoli rabe that's been sauteed with olive oil and garlic and so forth. Um, they were probably the best sausages I've ever had anywhere in my whole life. Sausages, you know, are usually made of, oh, God knows what they're made of. Um, you try not to think about that when you're eating sausage. But this, um, I've never had sausages that had so much um, really delicious, high quality meat in them. Um, and for dessert, um, I had to have just a little bit of coffee and a baba urum, which is actually a French dessert, but the Italians love it because it's it's pastry and it's soaked in wine uh, or rum in this case. Um, I did have some sun while I was there, believe it or not. Um, and here is um, the area around the university. Um, this is the Piazza Bovio um, and the old stock exchange building. Um, the statue of the guy on the horse is Vittorio Emanuele, who was the first king of the modern uh, Italy, 1860, um, when Italy finally became a, a united modern nation. And very close to this um, part of town is the Galleria Umberto I, um, who was named after the king at the time that it was built, which was about 30 years later, in like 1890 or so. Um, and if you've traveled elsewhere, um, in Northern Italy, in Milan, you may think it looks very similar um, to the Galleria in Milan. And um, that's because it was very deliberately designed to look exactly like the one in Milan. Um, Naples was not to be outdone. So they built um, a uh, beautiful uh, cross-shaped gallery um, that has uh, iron and glass roofs uh, with a huge dome in the center. Um, so it's a it's a very nice place to go when the weather um, is either too hot or too cold or too wet. Too wet. Um, it's full of shops and cafes and restaurants. Um, of course, I had to stop and have a little pizza and wine. Um, it's an incredibly uh, beautiful structure, both inside and out. Um, and right next to it um, is an interesting building, which unfortunately. Um, was closed when I was there. Um, I think they were doing some renovations. Um, this is the Royal Teatro de San Carlo, which is one of the oldest opera houses in the world. It opened in 1737. And it's actually part of the Royal Palace complex where we started at the very beginning. Um, so it's kind of, it's, it's attached to the Royal Palace and right across from the Galleria. The interior is fantastic and you can take tours, except when I was there, that wasn't possible, unfortunately. Um, it has been burned uh, a number of times um, through fires. Again, uh, Naples periodically has earthquakes. Um, and of course, um, it has suffered through two world wars. And um, so a lot of the downtown buildings have, um, have had to be restored over time. And there was a major restoration of this theater. Um, in the, I wanna say in the 80s or 90s. And so the interior, this is not my photograph, um, but just to show you what, uh, what it looks like inside. And you can, um, if you have a chance, you can also do uh, visit performances there. 
Um, in fact, speaking of restoring buildings, I just happened to notice one of the questions in the Q and A is um, about how often they have to restore these old buildings, and that's that's a good question, and it depends on, on a number of factors. Um, probably the most um, important of which is money. Um, as you can imagine, it costs an incredible amount of money to restore um, historic buildings that could be literally centuries old or older and that have uh, art that could be completely priceless um, and uh, materials that are hard to get and uh, workmanship that virtually nobody does anymore. So it's um, uh, Italy obviously takes pride in um, all of this uh, cultural heritage, but um, and some of that money Depending on the particular circumstances, the money may come from private donations, it may come from UNESCO, it may come from the European Union. Um, uh, as here in the United States, there's competition for all of those dollars or in Italy in, uh, for euros, and um, they do the best they can. But it's um, it's a massive undertaking to, to try to keep these buildings um, in in as good shape as they can because they are such an important driver for tourism it's high priority to do that certainly um, i also went to the northwest part of the city which is um, a little bit more upscale um, and it has a lot of beautiful old mansions this one's called the palazza sera de casano which has this beautiful um double staircase. And you can see this is another good example of the black and white um, design style where they're using different kinds of volcanic stone. Um, but even though this is a ritzier neighborhood, um, think Back Bay in Boston, for example, um, it has a lot of um, high fashion stores and fancy restaurants and so forth. Um, but it's still Naples, so you will find endless narrow streets with people hanging their laundry off the balconies. And because of the hills, you'll even see uh, streets on different levels. This archway actually has another of the neighborhood streets going across the top because um, it's a very steep neighborhood that goes up the hills. There's a lot of Art Nouveau buildings in the area as well. Um, and you can see this this probably would be compared to Newbury Street. <laughs> it's the Newbury Street of Naples, uh, with a lot of very fancy people um, spending money on beautiful clothes and so forth. But the architecture is also beautiful. Here's another um, a building. This is an old palazzo that is now office space. Um, and you can actually go in and look at the interior courtyard. And it has um, beautiful sculptures and this amazing elliptical staircase that goes up um, through the center of the building to the different office spaces. Um, there are shopping galleries um, and just a lot of really interesting buildings. These are fancy apartments in very elegant architectural styles. And uh, one of the more amazing churches, this is Santa Maria de Chiera with its um, really <laughs> Um, vibrantly colored facade, another good example of Italian Baroque. Um, but more recent buildings as well. These, uh, some of these were built in the late 19th, early 20th century. So they are kind of art deco and revival styles, um, mostly filled with very, very fancy and expensive um, apartments. And below this whole neighborhood um, is a long park right along the seaside. Um, with uh, gardens, this beautiful bandstand, there's a beach, um, uh, people go fishing there, there's even an aquarium, a small aquarium, and beautiful views out over um, the ocean across the Bay of Naples. Um, this is from the promenade, and you can see the island that's way off in the distance, it's the Isle of Capri, which is so, a couple hours um, by ferry. Um, and high on my list to eventually get there someday, uh, and preferably at a nicer time of year when it's not as chilly and, and wet. Um, and also along this stretch, if 
um, if you instead of looking out at the ocean, if you turn around and look back up the hill, um, you can see the hills just completely covered with these very fancy um, and brightly colored apartment buildings. And again, looking south, Vesuvius is just off um, out of the picture on the left, but you can see um, one of the castles that we'll visit in a minute and the entire peninsula um, where Sorrento is. Um, but at the opposite end of town, um, but also right along the water, is a very different kind of neighborhood, a much poorer neighborhood um, called the Mercato section of town. Um, it's very much not touristy, um, and it's it's definitely um, not upscale, um, but it's got one of the old original city gates, which you can see here. And a fun thing to do is to walk through the neighborhood when they're doing market day, um, which is almost every day. Um, there are whole streets that are lined with um, public market stalls that sell everything from food, uh, fish, fruits, vegetables, meats, um, but also household goods, clothes, um, pots and pans, um, you name it. Um, and it's a very fun neighborhood to walk around in to get uh, a little bit of a sense of the um, the daily life of of the city. Very narrow streets again. And there's some beautiful churches here as well. Um, the one on the right uh, that's very colorful is uh, the Basilica of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And then on the left, there's an, uh, an even older Gothic church that has this um, uh, clock built in an archway right over the street. And in this, uh, just on the edge of this neighbor neighborhood, I stumbled quite by accident on this um, small museum which is an old Renaissance palace. You can see from the uh, exterior, it, it very much looks like um, something you'd find in Florence, for example. Um, and uh, it was built by a Renaissance, in, during the Renaissance by a wealthy um, guy who had a huge art collection. And so what was originally his palace is now a museum with his very quirky collection of mismatched artworks and things that don't go together. Um, but, but it was a lot of fun <laughs> and um, the kind of museum not a lot of people bother to stop into because it's, it's just out of the way. Um, the building is from the 1400s, but he collected armor, paintings, uh, an incredible collection of ceramics, um, books as well. Um, here's his his private library. Um, you probably can't read this, um, but this odd contraption that you can see on the left is actually a chastity belt um, that somehow managed to get into his collection. Um, even though he was long since gone, um, it was acquired by the museum. And believe it or not, this is from the 19th century. I didn't even know they made such things then. But um, here's just some, some other street scenes. Uh, very often you'll be walking down a narrow street and you'll look, look up and see something beautiful or you'll look through an archway and see a, a little courtyard or a garden. And of course you have to stop for more food. This is a delicious salad of uh, roasted vegetables, mushrooms and peppers and um, squash. Um, if you like sausages, Italy is obviously a great place to go. Um, more of the streets. Naples in particular, I think of all the big Italian cities, um, is, is known for its old town having these incredibly narrow streets lined with buildings that are five, six, seven stories high. And many of them are pedestrianized. You can see how crowded it gets. Um, they even were doing Black Friday when I was there. Um, it's kind of disappointing to think that a, a uniquely American tradition has made its way over there. Um, but there's a huge amount of Christmas stuff going on in Naples. Um, whole areas in the downtown um, are selling all kinds of Christmas decorations. Um, in particular, these things called presepio, 
which are very popular and very elaborate, they are essentially nativity scenes, um, like uh, many of us might have in our houses um, around, around the Christmas holiday. Um, and they can be small, they can be huge. Most of the churches, in fact, will have um, an enormous one on display somewhere within the church, um, often with life-size figures. Um, and uh, you can buy all kinds of different um, figures that are uh, incredibly beautifully crafted and quite expensive. You can buy inexpensive little ones, you can buy fancy ones, there's uh, no shortage of them and whole neighborhoods in the downtown uh, historic districts um, sell them and have them on display. Um, but again, just throngs of very slow moving people going through the streets. Um, I, I found it interesting because again, I was here, I was there two months ago in early December. Um, and I was kind of surprised that um, as, as much as it was mobbed with tourists, almost all the tourists I encountered were Italians. There were very few tourists from other countries. Um, hardly any Americans, an occasional French or German tourist, but almost everybody there were Italians um, from other parts of Italy who were going to uh, Naples because it's, uh, it's December and that's um, a season when there's just so much going on there. Um, so it was kind of nice to see uh, the Italians enjoying their own, uh, their own destinations. Um, you can see, uh, if, we, if we look the other direction, you can see all the way up to the castle, um, Castel Sant Elmo, which is up on the hill. I'll take you up there in a sec. And some more just narrow little streets, a couple views from my room, um, where you can see in all directions to the, the major monuments throughout the old town. Um, not far from where I stayed was another um, interesting piazza. This is called the Piazza Bellini, named after the famous composer. Um, and it's got some of the oldest ruins um, below the level of the modern street. The walls that you're seeing here are actually from the original Greek um, settlement that was here, the city that was here in 800 BC. Um, and over the centuries, the city has been built up in layers over the previous inhabitants. Um, if you are there, um, you should absolutely not miss the National Archaeology Archaeological Museum, which is probably the the highlight. I think uh, if if there's one thing that you're going to do in Naples, it's you should go here. Um, it is also one of the best museums um, in Italy. Um, it focuses primarily on sculptural collections um, as opposed to paintings, um, and many of their works um, come from the wealthy Farnese family, which has a huge palace in Rome, which is now, in fact, it's now the French embassy uh, in Rome. Um, but the Farnese family um, collected artwork for a very long period of time, and they have some of the most important works um, in Italian uh, art history. Here are, uh, and the collection at this museum um, has, has most of them at this point. Here is on the left, Hercules, um, and on the right is Atlas, two of the most famous sculptures in the museum. Um, the Grand Stairway, and on the right um, is something called the Farnese Bull. See the head of the bull here. Um, it is considered to be the largest single ancient sculpture ever found. Um, and um, the building itself is equally impressive. It's, it's a gorgeous classical building. And the collections, you could easily spend a full day um, wandering through. And I would uh, certainly recommend going there, especially if you don't have an opportunity to visit Pompeii uh, or the ruins at either Pompeii or Herculaneum, because um, many of the artworks um, from those uh, archaeological sites are now housed in this museum. So you can still get um, a very good um, exposure to a lot of the things that they found. There, there are extensive collections of frescoes and mosaics and other kinds of artworks um, 
decorative arts like glassware and pottery and so forth, um, and uh, pieces of, uh, in particular, frescoes um, that were taken from the from the ruins. There are bronzes, there are ceramics, there are household items. So there really is an awful lot here that is uh, that will bring um, ancient Pompeii to life, even if you aren't uh, able to get to see the ruins themselves. There's also, <laughs> just for fun, there's a um, there's a very strange little section. There's a few rooms that's called the secret cabinet, um, and it actually um, is quite old. It, it's a series of rooms that date way back to the Bourbon monarchy. Um, it's not just a new thing. Um, and that's where uh, the royal family at that time stored their collections of erotic art. Um, and you can see some quite obvious examples here. Um, there are sculptures, there are paintings, um, but this is real art. Many of these things um, were found in Pompeii um, and other ruins, um, but they kept them sequestered in this area because they were considered inappropriate for um, all audiences. And for the past 200 years, in fact, um, the access to these rooms has been limited. And technically, even now, if you're over, if you're under 14 years old, you have to have an adult with you to go in and see um, and see these. Um, although when I was there, there was nobody checking. So I, I don't know that that's actually really as they take it as seriously as they might have in, in decades past. Um, Another uh, highlight to visit is at the very highest point of the city is um, the Castel San Elmo, um, which you can see um, way up at the top. And in front of it, the building that's in front of it um, is something called the Cer Certosa de San Martino, which is a monastery. And the two of them are practically on top of each other. There has been a fortress um, here since the late 13th century, although much of what you see is from about a century later. Um, you can drive to the top, there's a funicular, um, or if you're ambitious, you can um, walk. There's a very pleasant road that goes all the way up to the top. And when you get up there, you just, you can see how massive um, this fortress really is um, and the enormous entrance ramps that go up to the main gate, which has um, the Imperial Eagle over the front entrance. Uh, it is, of course, now a museum, a military museum. Um, and uh, you can also walk all the way around the parapets to get um, incredible views back um, to the city and looking down, uh, particularly to the old city where you can see some of the, uh, the big monasteries that I showed you earlier, Santa Chiara here, um, and this central uh, road uh, that goes all the way through, uh, way down to the train station at the opposite end. Um, that's Via Domenico Capitale, and um, you can see tons and tons of church domes. That's the um, cathedral off in the distance up in the upper left. So the views out over the bay are, are just gorgeous all the way back to Vesuvius um, and the modern uh, uh, shipping port. Um, and even you can see all the way back inland to the Capodimonte Palace, the art gallery um, that's in the park. And off to the west, um, way off in the distance, that big bump um, is the island of Ischia, which is one of the more popular um, destinations, particularly in the summer um, in the Bay of Naples. Um, in fact, you, you may have heard the, the most recent news about Ischia is um, a few weeks before I went, uh, I think it might have been in November, um, they had some very heavy rains, um, and there was a deadly mudslide um, that occurred in Ischia that killed a number of people and destroyed a number of houses. Um, and here, looking down to the Royal Palace, uh, where we were earlier, and the, um, the, the big piazza across the street with its dome, as well as the castle that we saw earlier and the glass roofs of the Galleria Umberto. 
and all the warm colors of the old city. The cathedral, I, I'm sorry, not cathedral, monastery that's also at, um, up at the top of this hill um, is uh, the Certosa, the San Martino, which means charter house. Um, it's a monastery that has now been turned into a museum and it's right adjacent to the fortress. It used to be a Carthusian monastery, 14th century, um, and the interior is exquisite, um, completely covered top to bottom with marble and frescoes. Um, incredible detailing um, in the Baroque style um, and with some later additions done in the 17th century. Um, and a very pleasant thing up here as well is the very calm um, and peaceful cloister, um, which is a much more serene style. It's, it's, um, it's an earlier style that isn't over the top Baroque, um, like you see inside the church. It's just a, a very calming um, a garden set up way high over the ocean. Uh, it even has a little cemetery um, that has creepy skulls on top. These are not human skulls, by the way. These are just sculptures made of stone, um, but they delineate the cemetery in the corner of the cloister. Um, and some other sculptures here. And um, there are terraces outside, gardens um, outside the, the monastery that because they are so high up, they're just, they're just beautiful. You can um, wander around the gardens and there are flowers and vines and trees. Um, and then you have this spectacular view out over the Bay of Naples, looking down um, to the city and the mountains off in the distance. This is a particularly nice neighborhood. So there's a number of mansions when you get up to the top. Um, but uh, as you work your way back down um, the hill, um, you'll go through a number of these kind of iconic street scenes in a neighborhood that's known as the Spanish Quarter that goes down into the old city. Um, this is another part of town that's a little on the, uh, definitely on the poor side. Um, but it has a lot of vibrant street life, and uh, here's a fish market, lots of stuff like that going on. And the view back up to the top of the hill. Um, while I was there, the World Cup was going on, and even though um, Italy was no longer in it um, at that point, um, uh, they are big into football, so they um, were there were decorations everywhere and um, you could not go into any restaurant at night when there wasn't the television showing whatever particular match was going on at the time. Um, back downtown, here's another just um, example of a, a very old church stuck between two uh, very modern buildings. Um, this is the university. Um, Naples has um, a number of universities. This is the biggest. And um, as a result, there's a lot of, it's a very young city. You'll see lots and lots of young people. Um, and they, of course, keep a lot of the nightlife going in the, the cafe and restaurant scenes. Um, there's, in addition to all the things that people usually do, like Pompeii and Amalfi and so forth, there's a couple of other um, day trips that you might want to take um, that people don't always do. So I thought I would show you those instead. Um, this is the Royal Palace of Caserta, and I'm showing you a, a satellite view from Google just to give you an idea of how big it is. It's about 15 miles north. Um, you can easily take the train. Um, there are organized tours, but for only about 10 euros, you can hop on the train and be there in half an hour. Um, it's it's often called the Versailles of Italy, um, and it isn't quite that big, but it's pretty close. Um, there's this enormous um, royal palace, and then the gardens, which extend, um, oh, I think it's two kilometers um, up this um, gorgeous long um, avenue. Um, and it's a, it's a stunning building as well as the gardens too. Um, here's a, a view of the front. Um, this again is another one of the royal palaces built by the Bourbons, 
um, Charles the Seventh um, in the 18th century, and it was um, specifically built to rival Versailles. They were trying to build something that was equally impressive. Um, and it certainly is. It has over 1,200 rooms, um, 1,000 fireplaces, and it is one of, in terms of floor area, it's one of the largest royal palaces anywhere in the world. Um, this is the, the entryway actually goes all the way through the, um, there's a covered arcade that goes through the central part of the palace. And then there's an immense staircase that's probably the most um, dramatic feature of the building. And um, again, like the Royal Palace back in um, downtown Naples, the state rooms here are uh, incredibly elaborate, um, highly decorated state apartments that were used for the royal family to live in and also to entertain and receive um, dignitaries from elsewhere in Italy and around the world. This is the throne room. But if you like palaces, um, this is definitely uh, should be high on your list. Um, and if you get tired of wandering through endless state rooms, um, you'll probably at least enjoy, particularly if the weather is nice. I got lucky. I did have a very nice day for this. Um, this long garden park, um, which is about, it's like two kilometers. It's a, it's a little bit over a mile want to say. Um, and you can either walk it um, yourself or they have little shuttle buses um, that will take you back and forth if you if you aren't in a position to walk that far. Um, and all along are reflecting pools, um, elaborate uh, sculptures, um, alleys of trees, and then this view back down the hill towards the palace in the distance. Most of the sculptural groups are um, mythological in, in some way, depicting some kind of uh, stories from usually Roman mythology. Um, so there are cascades and pools and fountains. And there's even a, a very nice uh, garden off to the side, which is quite large um, and was deliberately built in an English style instead of the regimented um, French and Italian style, um, where everything is cut and trimmed. This is a much more relaxed design that has paths and ponds and um, uh, forests and glades and so forth. And folly is also like um, fake temples. This is actually a um, fascinating hidden pool. They actually built little rock, fake rock grottos um, with caves, man-made caves that you can explore. Um, and here you are supposedly surprising the goddess Diana in her bath, as the unfortunate Acteon did in myth. Um, and uh, she turned him into a stag and his dogs killed him. Um, so don't do that um, if you happen to encounter a goddess in the woods. And um, the view back, um, just all the way back down to the um, the palace off in the distance is, is just incredible. And I'm going to fi finish the program by taking you to one other little place. Um, if you go back um, again, we were here's the city of Naples um, up here, along with um, the port where most of the ferries come from. And uh, Ischia is this large island here. Um, and I went to, instead of going to Ischia, I went to a smaller island called Procida, which is this, this little one here. Um, it's probably the most accessible of the islands. It's only about 45 minutes by boat. Um, and you can stop there on the way to Ischia. Um, and it's a delightful place to spend, if you just wanted to go for the day, um, it's a nice way to get out onto the ocean to take a boat ride. Um, see what the harbor looks like. Um, this is the lighthouse at the edge, at the entrance to the harbor. Um, there's been a lighthouse here actually for the past, oh, 600 years almost. Um, although this version was uh, rebuilt in the 1950s. 
the statue that you can see blessing the waterfront is San Genero, who is the um, patron saint of the city. Rem remember him from the cathedral. Um, and although I had lousy weather, it was still a lovely place to visit. I would certainly enjoy being there when it was sunny, but um, even on a drab day, um, the colors are just so vibrant. It's a, it's mainly a fishing island, fishing and tourism. There's only about um, 10,000 people on the whole island. Um, and it's, as you can imagine, it's extremely popular during the, the warm summer months and very crowded. Um, here's uh, one of the churches right down in the port. Um, and up here is a road that heads up the hill. This particular church is uh, dedicated to um, St. Mary of Mercy, um, and it's a, a, a maritime church dedicated to sailors and uh, memorializing those who died um, at sea. Um, it's uh, for a tiny island, it's actually surprisingly hilly, and you can climb all the way up to the, um, to the highest point on the island where there is a little palace. Um, and also an abbey from the 16th century with this uh, with an abbey church. And even better is a view down to the marina below, which just has, as I said, this was a very gray kind of dismal winter day, but the colors were just incredible. Um, this is sort of the iconic view of the island um, with all these multicolored houses built up one on top of the other. Um, nestled around this bay full of fishing boats. Um, in the summer, at the height of the tourist season, there are, um, you can go swimming, there are beaches, fishing, um, and tons and tons of fish restaurants that are open. Many of them were closed um, in the couple of weeks before Christmas because there's just not that many tourists to, uh, to keep them open. Um, the island is uh, is pretty enough that it's been used for a number of film uh, locations as well. The talented Mr. Ripley from a number of years ago was filmed there, as was um, that famous uh, Italian film Il Postino, The Postman, uh, was also filmed in part on this island. Um, it's still a working fishing port, so in much the same way that Gloucester, Massachusetts is a mix of tourism and real hardworking fishermen. This this is actually a, a similar kind of place. It lives off both tourism and fishing. And uh, again, a number of uh, just beautiful little churches tucked into corners. I loved this one because it had all these beautiful sea foam kind of ocean colors um, on the interior. And there's a number of villas. Um, you can walk around the island very easily. It's not very big, um, and um, uh, when you get once you get out of the main town, you'll find a lot of very nice um, older older mansions and also newer ones because wealthy um, Italians build seaside villas in places like this. Of course, it's another another example of one. Um, and you are never far from the sea. It's such a small island you, if that when you get in the middle, you can actually see the sea on both sides. Um, here's another one of the little fishing villages um, on the far west of the island, looking towards Ischia. And of course, um, because it was chilly and I was waiting for my ferry, um, I had to sit in a cafe and have pastries and coffee until it was time to go home. Um, and uh, got back late at night. Um, the ferry ride was actually kind of rough because um, even though it's not very far um, from the port, uh, it, it was fairly windy. Um, but um, the fast ferry only takes about 45 minutes. And again, here you can see some of the other um, big ferries that will uh, go to, uh, they go to Sicily, they go to other parts of Italy, they go to uh, other islands of the Mediterranean. Um, but you can see what it's like to come back um, past the working lighthouse, um, back into the center of town. So I will end my program there and then take a look at the chat. Let's stop my share, screen share, and look at the questions, see what I have missed. Um, oh, a whole bunch of questions. 
uh, oh, someone's mentioning the um, the uh, the Neapolitan scene, the nativity scenes that they do for Christmas, um, and is mentioning that they do them, uh, they do a display of them at the Met in New York City. I didn't know that. Um, how did the eruption affect Naples? I assume by the eruption, you're talking about the one from uh, that buried Pompeii. Um, and actually, um, I, I don't know really for sure, but um, Naples was sufficiently far away that um, although it was certainly affected, it wasn't buried or destroyed in any um, uh, of the same to the same degree that um, the places very close to it were like um, Pompeii and uh, Herculaneum. Did I see any mosques? No, that's an interesting question. Um, Italy has, I was actually reading about this recently um, for a, a, another reason. Um, Italy uh, only recently, actu actually, I don't think Italy recognizes, um, officially recognizes Islam as a religion. Um, and at this point, I believe there are only a couple of mosques uh, operating anywhere in the city, and they are very recently built. They're definitely not historic. So Italy doesn't have any of the tradition that, um, um, because it was not part of the Ottoman Empire, so it did not have, uh, you won't see anything like you would in uh, the Balkans, where there is still a, a long tradition of um, of historic Islam, or in Spain, um, also where um, uh, centuries ago Islam was uh, was much more powerful. In Italy, there there is uh, a very small percentage of of Muslims and virtually no mosques in the entire country. I think there's one maybe somewhere. Um, I remember reading about. Um, how long was I there? I was there just one week. Um, but again, I. I did not do, with the exception of going to the palace and that island, which were like day trips, half day trips, um, I was exclusively in the city. Um, certainly, if you wanted to do, uh, to visit Pompeii or go down to the Amalfi Coast, you would want a lot more time. Um, the public transit is pretty easy. There's a very extensive bus and train service. So uh, you could definitely get around without a car. Um, if you wanted to tour some of those areas. Um, were there places you traveled to that you didn't want to leave or are there places you'll always want to go back to? Oh yeah, almost. I would say almost every place I go falls into that category. Um, what impact did World War II have on the city? Um, I don't know enough about that. Um, myself, except um, Italy obviously had um, major uh, involvement in World War II, and there were bombings. So um, uh, there was definitely war damage um, in Naples um, as a result of World War II. Um, there were a number of uh, famous battles um, that occurred in the area it was like between Rome and Naples. In fact, um, Oh, what was the famous one? Monte Cass is it Monte Cassino? Um, is not terribly far inland, and that was um, that campaign was uh, very intense. Um, there's some uh, excellent books on that. Um, so Naples was not bombed to the same degree that other European cities were, but it certainly um, suffered a certain amount of damage. Um, where did all the money come from to pay for all this stuff? Well, um, the Catholic Church has always um, has always been sitting on plenty of money. <laughs> and, um, so yeah, it's um, centuries ago, the the popes had more than enough money, and there, of course, were plenty of private, uh, wealthy families who were very eager to, make their mark um, and buy religious favor or by um, political favor by building and um, having their names attached to beautiful churches and beautiful artworks and so forth. Um, how, oh, oh, hi, Kathy. This is um, 
someone I know, Kathy Everly, is asking, how long was your trip to see all of this? Um, again, this was like seven or eight days, I think. And what reading and prep do I do prior to my trip? I, um, I always do lots of reading because for me, travel is um, a way to learn about the world. So I'm reading um, history books about the city, um, history about the artwork. And then I do a lot of, when I'm putting my programs together, I do a lot of subsequent follow-up research to um, get details on stuff that I saw where I might've forgotten the specifics. Um, what was Naples like regarding COVID? Um, COVID re uh, regulations have pretty much disappeared in Italy at this point, which doesn't mean there isn't still COVID, obviously, but um, I saw very, very few people with masks. I saw, um, as you can see from the photos, there were tons and tons of crowds and nobody seemed terribly concerned about COVID. Um, and I don't recall any place, even public transportation, um, there were no requirements um, and uh, Europe is not uh, requiring any tests um, coming in and out like they were even as recently um, as a year ago. So um, they're really, uh, it, I, I would say it basically would be up to you to decide how concerned you were. I saw a few people with masks, but not many. Um, is it easy to get around if you don't know any Italian? Yes. Um, in Naples, yes, absolutely. It's a huge tourist city. Um, there are um, visitors from any number of countries. Um, there's all over Europe, all over Asia, Americans. So almost um, any place that you go is going to speak at least basic English. Um, and um, many of the uh, museums and uh, castles and palaces and things like that will have English language tours. Um, so it always helps to learn Italian um, or at least some basic phrases. I think it's always polite anywhere you go to learn, please, thank you, hello, goodbye, um, and basic phrases like that. But beyond that, um, you don't really need to know Italian. Um, is there a Jewish population? Um, Italy does have a Jewish population. It obviously is less than it was um, back in uh, a century ago. Um, I'm not exactly sure how how it compares, though. Um, but there are yes, there are definitely Italian Jews today. Um, but I couldn't tell you how like exactly how many there are. Um, the, oh, the palace that I mentioned, the big palace that was um, outside the city is called Caserta, C-A-S-E-R-T-A. -E um, and um, it's definitely in all the guidebooks if you if you are interested in going there. It's a very, uh, it's a very much a very easy, uh, even a half day trip. You wouldn't need to spend the whole day because it's barely like 40 minutes on the train. Um, let's see what else. Um, I've noticed a couple of questions about um, safety. And yes, that's a good one. I have heard that as well. Um, and I am pleased to say that um, I had a perfectly delightful time in Naples. I never once felt unsafe. Um, it is very often described as a dangerous city for tourists. And my personal experience for what it's worth is um, there are uh, there are a couple of neighborhoods that I think at night I would probably avoid um, the Spanish Quarter in particular and the Mercato section. I particularly if you're like traveling, I was there alone, so I would probably they're a little sketchy and I would not be likely to walk around those neighborhoods at night by myself. Um, the old town where I was. Um, was crowded at all times of day and night um, and it always felt perfectly safe i think the main thing that you would want to be concerned about um, is just pickpocketing which is that's the kind of normal thing that um, is hardly unique to naples um, and is common in almost any uh, major city including boston um, so uh, 
but the the sort of Naples is a scary place to visit. No, I didn't experience that at all. Um, and um, as I said, I was there alone. Uh, if I were a woman traveling alone, I'd probably feel a little bit different. But again, the the streets were so full of people um, that about the only thing that I could imagine uh, being concerned about is just keeping an eye on your wallet and you know just generally being aware of your surroundings and so forth. Um, which is is sensible advice, no matter where you are. Um, I did not feel that Naples was any different from any other European city that I've visited. Um, let's see, did I miss any others? I'm looking through. Um, how far? Um, how far is the Amalfi Coast? It's not far. Um, it really isn't very far. Um, if you're driving, um, I know they're trying to discourage driving um, because the, the traffic during high season can get pretty bad. But as I said, it's it's pretty accessible by train. I mean, Vesuvius is only nine miles away, so you can get to Vesuvius or Pompeii in less than an hour on the train. Um, uh, Amalfi is obviously a little farther, um, and if you have a car, you'd be able to explore more on your own. Um, but you can get by train or bus to a lot of those destinations. Um, and I think if you were to go for, say, a week and a half or two weeks, you could certainly do a few days in Naples and then um, spend the rest of your time working your way around, um, around the coast. Uh, Naples is well known for its beautiful love songs. Yes, I heard a lot of those being sung, uh, particularly by um, people who've had a little too much wine late in the evening. Um, da, 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 da. I, okay, I think I got all the questions, but if not, let me know. Um, I will, um, I, uh, I think the library usually sends a follow up message and um, I'll have them send out my email. So if anyone has any questions um, in the future, or if, oh, actually, I can just give it to you now. Wait a minute. Can I send? I, yes, I can put it to everyone. Um, this is my email address. So if I missed any questions or you have any additional ones, um, feel free to shoot me an email and um, I'll be happy to talk to you that way. I believe my next program for Chelmsford is a month from now, and I think it's Miami. Um, so that'll be quite different um, from, uh, from Naples. And uh, I hope to see you there is, let's see. Uh, I think that's it. I'm also doing, um, there's also a program I know, um, the um, Chelmsford Library uh, partners with the Tewksbury Library, um, and I do programs for both, so some of you may be familiar with both of those. Um, I think in two weeks I am doing um, a program for the Tewksbury Library, which is on um, Bucharest, uh, the capital of Romania. So that's a little bit different too. Um, so I might uh, be able to see some of you there as well. So uh, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you got a little bit of a, uh, the sense that I was trying to get across that Naples is not just one of those places you swing by on your way to other places. It's well worth a visit on its own and um, ranks way up there with um, all the other Italian, big Italian cities. So I hope you'll get a chance to go there at some point. And I hope I will see you at um, one of the next programs in the next few weeks. So thanks everyone and good night.